Hi everybody, welcome back to Moral Psychology with me, Dr. Josh Redstone, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about altruism. I say a little bit because I've decided to truncate this lecture for a couple of reasons, uh, which uh, I suppose I'd better explain before we get started. So, so firstly, firstly, this, this is, probably is probably the longest, longest chapter, chapter in, in this book, book and, and it, it is, is a, a dry, dry one. one. Not, Not to, get to get ahead of myself, myself but basically, basically what the authors, the authors of this chapter, chapter are doing, like, like, taking a look at something called, called the MPE altruism, altruism hypothesis, which is, which is a hypothesis that comes to us from Daniel, Daniel Batson, Batson, which basically, which basically says, says that, that um, empathy, empathy can, can elicit, elicit or promote, promote uh, altruistic, altruistic motivation. motivation. So, so it motivates us, uh, empathy motivates us to behave in altruistic ways or pro-social ways or Healthy healthy behavior. Behavior. There, are there are many ways, ways to hash this out. And in, in, in any case, case that's, that's what the chapter is all about. And the authors essentially do a, do bit, a bit of a setup, setup and, then and then take, take a, a close, close look, look at Batson's and the altruism hypothesis and, and see how that, that hypothesis stands against, against a number of other uh, hypotheses which explain egoistic and altruistic behavior, healthy behavior, so on and so forth, that deserve these various experiments. And seeing, and seeing how, how these alternative, alternative hypotheses stand up, up to the MPM and altruism hypothesis. hypothesis. They run, they run through a number, number of different experiments, experiments and a number of these alternative, alternative hypotheses. And as, as I was reading through this chapter, chapter I, thought I thought to myself, to myself that, that well, well, on one, one hand, boy, I really, I really forgot, forgot how long this chapter, chapter was. was. On the other, other hand, uh, it kind of falls in an odd place with the textbook. If I were editing this book, I think I would have... Uh, short, uh, short this chapter, chapter bit, bit, and perhaps, perhaps put it, put it after, after the evolution of the morality, morality chapter. chapter. In, any In any case, case I won't, won't be going, going through the whole chapter today. today. Because, because it's, it's so long, long and dry and, dry and a little cumbersome, cumbersome. What, what I've decided, decided to do is mostly talk, talk about, about the empathy altruism hypothesis and, and the practical reasoning stuff that the authors talk about. And then I'll leave another reading linked to you on C Learn. Uh, it should, be, should available be available once the lecture, lecture is available, available. About, about empathy. empathy. Because, because I, I think that empathy, empathy will be a good uh, candidate to offer for a special, special topics, topics lecture. Empathy, empathy and morality, morality or perhaps, or perhaps looking, looking at the empathy, empathy, empathy and all of my hypothesis in more detail, detail there. there. So because, so because this, is this is so dense, dense I really, really decided, decided to just, just uh, pick, pick out, out the main, main themes and then maybe leave you with a little, little bit of extra reading about empathy, empathy, empathy if you're curious about empathy, empathy which, which will, will serve, serve us well, well should we should end, end up doing uh, another, another lecture, lecture possibly, possibly a special, special topic, topic, topic lecture, lecture on empathy later, later on the course. course. A second reason that I've decided to truncate this lecture is that uh, right about now, I imagine all of you are busy studying for and writing your midterm. And since I am still slightly behind with the lectures, I thought, wouldn't it be nice to just um, give everyone, myself included, a little bit of a break? Because I know that all of you are not just contending with this class, but all of your other classes, as well as life itself, uh, in these difficult COVID-19 times. So... Um, for those reasons, this will not be a super long lecture. There will be a bit of extra reading. You certainly don't have to read the entire chapter. I think you'd probably be good if you read the first two sections and possibly a bit of the third. Um, in any case, what I cover in this lecture will feature on future tests and quizzes, but anything that I don't cover from the textbook will not feature on those quizzes, so don't worry about that. So with that said, let's get started and talk a little bit about altruism. All right, so firstly, what is altruism? What is altruistic behavior? What is altruistic motivation? Well, the authors of this chapter define altruism thusly. They say altruism is the belief in or the practice of acting in selfless ways, that is, ways that benefit others at a cost to yourself. Sometimes altruistic uh, behavior overlaps with pro-social behavior. So pro-social behavior covers the, um, you know, benefiting others part, but not necessarily the cost to yourself part. Um, so we can behave in ways that benefit others without necessarily acting altruistically. That is, we can behave in ways that benefit others uh, that aren't, uh, that don't cost us anything, right? Resources, time, effort, those kinds of things. 
And altruism is often contrasted with egoism. Egoism of, is, of course, um, uh, this idea that we behave in ways that are self-interested, uh, or we act out of self-interest. Even if we behave pro-socially, for example, perhaps we could do so ego egoistically by acting out of self-interest. You know, say, for example, uh, you volunteer at the soup kitchen. You decide uh, that uh, this would be a good thing to do. Are you behaving altruistically or egoistically? Well, it depends on a number of things. If, for example, you are volunteering at the soup kitchen, helping get meals to people and so on and so forth, um, and you are doing so um, pr primarily because it feels good to you to do that, well, that's pretty egoistic. If your primary motivation has come from, you know, just making yourself feel good um, by helping these people, yes, you're helping these people, you are behaving pro-socially, but your motivation is egoistic. However, if you're doing this at a cost to yourself, perhaps sacrificing time doing something else that you like in order to volunteer at the soup kitchen and help others, say I give up um, practicing my guitar, I give up a couple hours a week doing that, which I really like doing, in order to uh, benefit the uh, people who uh, can only find meals at uh, soup kitchens and homeless shelters and that sort of thing, uh, well then, I'm acting altruistically. So that's the difference between those two. And notice in both cases, I'm behaving in a pro-social way, right? Whether my motivation is egoistic or altruistic, I'm behaving in a way that benefits someone else. But in the altruistic uh, version, I'm doing that at a cost to myself. In the egoistic version, I am not doing it at a cost to myself. In fact, I receive a benefit feeling really good about having helped. Um, at the same time as behaving pro-socially. So that's egoism, altruism, and pro-social behavior. All right, so what does it matter what my motivations are, specifically with respect to morality? What, what does it matter whether I'm altruistically motivated or egoistically motivated? Well, um, this debate on whether people are uh, by and large altruistically or egoistically motivated or act in altruistic versus egoistic ways has important implications for debate about whether we can really truly be said to act morally. Um, so, and this, this is coming from a variety of different uh, moral theoretic frameworks in the history of philosophy, right? Like Kant, who is a, a deontologist all about duty, thought that for an action to be moral, or to properly count as moral, it has to be done from duty. It can't be done out of self-interest, right? It has to be done from duty. And Aristotle, um, arguably the paragon example of a virtue ethicist, um, thought that acting virtuously required you to choose the right kinds of actions, virtuous actions, for their own sake. Um, it's not always clear what that means, but it cannot be, um, uh, it cannot be uh, a kind of instrumental uh, reason or uh, a self-interested reason why we choose these actions. They have to be chosen from their own, for their own sake to count as virtuous actions. Um, so there you have it. Um, we have to be motivated to act from the right um, duties, principles, rules, um, or more, holis more holistically in the case of virtue ethics, we have to do things for their own sake and not to some other end um, in order to really be moral, in order for our acts to count as truly moral or for our motivations to count as truly moral. But if egoism is true, that is, if people... Um, sometimes or often act out of self-interest, even when they're behaving in pro-social ways, um, then we can, can we really say that our actions are moral? That's an important question that really still hasn't been settled within moral philosophy, right? Um, so if we never act altruistically, or if we always act egoistically, or even predominantly egoistically, can we really say that we are acting morally? If, if what we're doing is from self-interest and not for the good or for duty or for its own sake, right? So that's one important question that pops up here. 
Um, another important issue that egoism raises. Um, if egoism is true, that is if people are by and large egoistic in terms of their motivations to act and in terms of the acts they perform, why should we be moral, right? Um, huh, geez, this is a tough one. <laughs> I mean, it's easy to fall down a kind of um, moral skeptic rabbit hole here, right? If, if, uh, if egoism is true and if people act out of their own self-interest, why should I be moral? Why should I, why should I do what is good or do something for its own sake? Why should I be good for the sake of being good? If really I'm, I'm, motivated to act out of my own self-interest. It gets even worse than that and murkier than that. Um, you know, if I'm acting in a self-interested way, I may just happen to act in a way that accords with what a certain moral theoretic framework would demand, right? Um, but we come back to this problem we encountered before. Uh, uh, we've encountered this problem with respect to There's music coming from somewhere. One second. So if egoism is true, another problem is um, how do we understand moral motivation? Indeed, how could there be moral motivation if all of our actions are done out of self-interest? It could be true that I may act out of self-interest and my acts may accord with what one particular moral theory might de demand in such and such a situation. But if I'm not being motivated to act by the right kinds of desires or beliefs, that is moral desires or moral beliefs and so on and so forth, then how can I be said to be moral? How can I be said to be acting morally in such a situation? I can't really be said to act morally in such a situation according to many thinkers and that therein lies the problem uh, of egoism, right? There's also this issue raised in the text uh, by the authors about this idea that ought implies can, right? Um, uh, norms, of course, are all about oughts or ought nots, right? Um, <clears throat> and we need norms for morality. And, and saying we ought to or ought not to do something implies that we can or and thereby cannot uh, choose to not do that thing, rather, I should say, if we want to. Um, we can only say that we ought to do things, in other words, if doing those things is uh, possible or feasible, right? So, so what's, what's the problem, problem here, here concerning, concerning egoism, egoism and altruism? altruism? Well, well if, if people, people cannot, cannot be motivated, motivated to, act to act out of anything, out of anything, anything other than self-interest, well, well, then, then we, can't we can't really say, say the, that, they that they ought to be motivated, be motivated by anything beyond, beyond self-interest, right? right? You see, you what, see what, what I'm saying? If ought implies can, but, but people, people cannot, cannot um, you know, you know, if, if ought implies, implies can, can and people, people cannot, cannot X, X, then I, then I can't say that, that you ought to X, X if that's, that's something, something you can't do. do. So, so if, if people uh, can't, can't be motivated, motivated to act, act out of anything besides self-interest, self -interest, if they, they cannot, cannot really, really be said, said to act altruistically, or if they cannot really have altruistic motivations, then then. I can't, I can't, I can't say, say that they ought to be motivated, motivated by anything, anything beyond, beyond self-interest, self right? right? And anything, anything beyond, beyond self-interest here, here means, means these various moral, moral theoretic, theoretic frameworks, frameworks that we've been, that we've been considering. considering. So, so, all right, all right. well, well uh, that's, that's all, all I'll, I'll say, say for egoism, egoism for, for the moment. moment. Let's, Let's talk, talk a little, little bit about altruism now. now. All right, well, so far I've been talking about altruism in terms of uh, like a motivational context, right? So I've been talking about what is called altruistic motivation, and that is what the empathy altruism hypothesis deals with. Um, altruistic motivation would be act, uh, being a uh, motivation to act in ways that benefit others at a cost to yourself, of course. But there are lots of different ways to understand altruism. Um, in fact, there are two pretty big important ways um, that it would be really good to make sure that everybody is clear on whether you decide to read through the rest of this chapter or not. Um, so one of those ways is psychological altruism, and another of those ways is evolutionary altruism. And they are, in fact, very different things. 
Um, so psychological altruism is the sort of thing we've been talking about so far, right? Psychological altruism is what we could contrast with psychological egoism, right? An agent uh, acting in ways that benefit others uh, at a cost to him or herself versus acting out of self-interest. So here we're talking about individual agents, moral agents, um, and um, and this is where altruistic motivation fits into the picture, right? What is it that's motivating the acts of these agents? Um, and if they are not motivated by altruistic motivations, but by egoistic motivations, can we properly speak of those acts as being moral? Or indeed of, the moral, of that motivation for doing that act as being moral, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, that leads to yet a, a further distinction we can make within uh, psychological altruism, and that is that we can think of psychological altruism as something that gives motivational force to our actions, right? Like a state of mind or a disposition to uh, act in ways uh, that benefit others at a cost to oneself. These could be altruistic beliefs, altruistic desires, right? Um, perhaps emotions. Uh, it depends on what kind of moral motivation theory you adhere to, right? Whether you're a, an instrumentalist or a sentimentalist or a cognitivist, so on and so forth. But we can think of psychological altruism that way, or we can think about it in terms of normativity, right? We can think about it in the sense that one ought to act altruistically rather than out of self-interest. Um, and this kind of flips things around a bit, right? Where we have um, beliefs, motivations, and so forth that entail uh, altruistic acts and they count as moral because they are not done out of self-interest. Or we can have a norm uh, that, uh, that says don't act in self-interest, right? We, we do have a tendency to be self-interested, so don't act that way. Act altruistically instead so that we can distinguish it that way as well. Evolutionary altruism is a little bit different. Um, we've talked a little bit about this kind of thing vaguely um, previously. For example, when we talked about Robert Trivers' theory of reciprocal altruism, if you remember that. But in any case, evolutionary altruism um, refers to when an organism behaves in such a way uh, that benefits uh, the fitness of another organism at the cost of its own fitness. Now, what is fitness? This is, this is also something that's very important to make sure we get right. Fitness, uh, usually you hear talked about uh, in the sort of uh, like survival of the fittest kind of way, right? And people take that to mean the strongest or fastest or smartest individuals are the fittest and they survive. This is actually not at all what fitness means. In fact, there's many different ways to understand what fitness means, and the authors are interested in um, uh, a couple of different kinds here. One is individual fitness. An individual fitness refers to how many descendants an individual has. So um, if I, as an individual, have um, lots and lots of descendants, maybe I have tons of kids and tons of grandkids, I have pretty good individual fitness, but if I have no offspring, so that down the generations I have no descendants, well, then I'm not a very fit individual. But there's also inclusive fitness. Inclusive fitness refers to copies of an individual's genes rather than descendants that exist in subsequent generations. So, um, Inclusive fitness would include copies of genes that I carry, but also those same copies of those same genes that my relatives carry, all right? And because of that, um, it's difficult to identify, uh, or at least this, this can make it difficult to identify uh, truly evolutionarily altruistic behaviors. Another important uh, takeaway from this chapter, I think, um, is the author's discussion of practical reasoning, uh, or sometimes known as instrumental reasoning. Um, and this is central to this egoism and altruism debate, which um, I suppose is the main theme of this chapter, but really I guess that's one of, one of my gripes here, is that they, the authors do get 
quite focused on the empathy and altruism hypothesis at the expense of the egoism altruism debate as a whole, then again, you could have an entire class on that debate. So perhaps we best not get bogged down in, 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 uh, in this. Uh, nonetheless, um, central to this idea uh, and uh, or central to this debate is the idea that um, our actions are genuine or agentive. Um, that is, I am really the cause of my actions. I'm not some outside force, right? Like freedom of the will and touches on all this really interesting metaphysical stuff at the same time. In any case, um, uh, for this, you might want to recall our, our brief discussion of uh, propositional attitude psychology or folk psychology folk psychology, where beliefs and desires interact to sort of cause these chains of actions, right? Um, now, the authors outline a couple of criteria uh, upon which they take actions to count as genuine or agentive. So uh, genuine actions or agentive actions have to be caused by a desire, right? <clears throat> these desires um, can interact with beliefs to generate new chains of desires. This is what they call practical reasoning. Um, and of course, finally, some desires are instrumental and some are ultimate. Uh, this is similar to the idea of an intrinsic desire, but it's not quite the same. The ultimate desire is just what we ultimately desire, as the name suggests. Uh, instrumental desires are desires that uh, kind of get us to that ultimate desire, right? So if my ultimate desire is to satisfy my thirst, perhaps it's a really hot day and I'm really thirsty and I don't want to be thirsty, that's my ultimate desire. Well, then I'll form instrumental desires, um, such as getting up off the couch, a desire to get up, a desire to walk to the kitchen, a desire to open the fridge. And the reason why I form these instrumental desires is because I have other beliefs like beliefs that the fridge is in the kitchen and uh, that I am not presently in the kitchen and that within the fridge is something cool that will alleviate my thirst, right? Um, there are plenty of these examples spelled out in the textbook, but that's the basic idea is that this is all practical reasoning. And these three, three things, these three characteristics, um, actions are caused by desires, desires and beliefs interact and that's called practical reasoning. And some desires are instrumental and some are ultimate. These are all kind of uh, the three criteria that establish whether an, uh, an action is genuine or agentive or not, right? The case of a non-agentive uh, action here would be like a doctor hitting my knee with his hammer and, and my knee moving, which is just a reflex, right? I did not initiate that reflexive movement, right? There was no desire to move the leg and no beliefs that I could move my leg by doing such and such, right? So that's the difference there. <clears throat> uh, uh, I do have another example in my slides here. I guess I could go over that one. Um, um, it would be a bit clearer than that example I came up with on the fly a moment ago. Anyway, uh, so Jane desires to get an A-plus in her philosophy class, right? That's her ultimate desire. Jane believes she can get an A-plus by studying with her classmates. Okay, so there's a belief. We've got a belief there. Jane believes a good place to study is the library. All right, another belief. So these beliefs uh, interact with her ultimate desire, and she forms the instrumental desire to organize a study session in the library. Uh, and of course, this is all subserved by other beliefs and desires, like how to get to the library and so on and so forth. Um, so there you go. There's a couple of examples. I hope this makes it all uh, quite clear. But the, the, what the authors of this chapter are trying to emphasize here is that to count as moral agents, our actions have to be uh, agentive or genuine. So they have to be a result of these sorts of uh, uh, interactions between beliefs and instrumental desires and ultimate desires. Um, and our actions also have to be moral. So there need to be reasons why actions count as moral. This could be acting from duty or out of virtue or perhaps out of an altruistic desire. Um, and there need to exist intrinsic moral desires, not merely instrumental moral desires. So some of our ultimate desires need to be moral, right? So um, 
like I said earlier, I have to want to do what is good for its own sake, um, or from duty, or what have you. Not what feels good to me, or what might just make me seen or be viewed by my conspecifics as good, or what have you. So there's lots to unpack here, even without getting into the nuts and bolts of the rest of the chapter, right? Um, how can we distinguish between moral and pro-social actions? Well, there's oftentimes a lot of overlap here, but uh, not necessarily all pro-social actions are moral actions. Um, is there something distinct about moral acts? Well, yes, they have to have a, a morally motivated component, I suppose is a way of putting it. Um, again, I can act egoistically and still happen to act in a way that accords with what morality would demand or act in a way that happens to be pro-social. But if my motivation is out of self-interest, then I can't really talk about being morally motivated in that situation. So that's one way in which pro-social actions might be distinguished from moral actions. Um, of course, the big takeaway uh, from this is that if there are no intrinsic moral desires, morality is in trouble, altruism is in trouble. Um, in any case, discuss a little bit if you like in the comments section or on See You Learn. Um, tell me what you think. Well, what else? Well, obviously people disagree about what makes an act count as moral, right? A simple example of that is just uh, what different moral ethical frameworks will say about what is moral in certain circumstances. Um, likewise, as we've seen before, different theories of moral motivation um, would, uh, depending on the theory, um, uh, something something different, uh, well, let's start over. Depending on the theory, um, blah. depending on the theory, you might be required to have the right kinds of uh, ultimate desire or beliefs or emotions or character traits, right? Um, and you can spell out some examples uh, drawing from our previous lecture, lectures in the comment sections if you wish. But, um, this is kind of what the authors are concerned with. Um, if we act in self-interested ways, does that mean that our behavior cannot really count as moral? I'm inclined to agree that, yeah, it really wouldn't make it properly moral. I do think we need to have the right kind of motivation, um, whether that is the right kind of emotions or beliefs or desires or what have you. We have to have some moral motivation to um, to make our actions count as moral. Simply acting out of self-interest in a way that happens to accord with what is moral, what morality demands, or what might benefit others, even if it's not at a cost to ourselves. Um, yeah, I think I think I think those kinds of acts where you don't have that proper moral motivation shouldn't really count as moral. They should count as pro-social, of course but not necessarily moral. And indeed, there are thinkers like error theorists who say that there are no, uh, there are no such um, motivations, right? Um, there are moral claims we can make about our motivations, about our desires, our moral beliefs. They're just all wrong. Um, so if you fall into like the error theorist camp, then that's okay. You can still talk about behaving pro-socially, just not morally. Um, let me know how you feel about all of this in the comments section, by the way. Are you all right with um, there just being pro-social behaviors and not necessarily moral behaviors? Or is, is that a difference that makes no difference to you? I'd really like to hear what you think. So let me know on See You Learn or in the comments section. Well, the rest of the chapter concerns Basson's empathy and altruism hypothesis. So I'll just say a little bit about that. Um, because this is maybe something that I would like to cover in a different way than, than this chapter does in a special topics lecture. In any case, Daniel Batson has the empathy and altruism hypothesis, which says that empathy causes altruistic motivation. 
that is, empathy elicits in us a motivation to um, engage in behavior that increases uh, the benefit of others at a cost to ourself. And again, here we're talking about psychological altruism. But what is empathy? We haven't really talked a lot about what empathy is. Um, I understand empathy to mean a, not an emotion in its own right, but um, a way of coming to experience emotions that are consonant with another. So coming to experience the same emotions or emotions that are similar to those that you are experiencing. Um, and this can be uh, this can be accomplished a number of different ways, right? Um, I might believe that you are in a certain emotional state. I might have other beliefs about your situation that cause me to um, kind of experience something that's consonant with what you're experiencing. I might perceive that you're experiencing a certain way. I might imagine that you're experiencing uh, a certain range of feelings. Uh, there's lots of different ways to, to come to empathize with someone. And empathy is also closely related to, of course, other things like sympathy, which is um, much more welfare oriented. Uh, indeed, uh, Batson talks a lot about um, empathic concern, uh, which a lot of other thinkers simply call sympathy. Um, so, since uh, there's no standard terminology when it comes to empathy, as the authors of this chapter point out, what I think I will do is link you with a paper that attempts to standardize some of this, um, some of these different understandings of empathy. Um, it's a very brief read, so don't worry about that. So you can read the first little bit of this chapter and then read this paper on empathy. And what I'd like you to do is just reflect on this material. Again, this has been um, a brief lecture considering the chapter is so long, but I honestly forgot that this chapter was this long and dense and I, I wouldn't have covered altruism this way. I think I would have rather saved empathy and altruism for a special topics, um, for a special topics lecture. So that is what I suggest uh, we do with the rest of this material. Um, we kind of bracket it, set it aside, and perhaps our special topics lecture can be on empathy and morality. Uh, that's my suggestion for a special topics lecture in any case. Um, so that's all I really have to say for today. Um, again, you can just read the first part of this chapter and I'll, I'll link a paper on empathy uh, for all of you on CU Learn that you can check out. Um, in case you're interested, because empathy is something that comes up from time to time in this book. Uh, but again, there's no standard terminology, and I think that uh, we need a standard terminology. And I think the paper that I'm going to link you with, um, or link you to, does a very, very good job at standardizing all of this stuff. Um, so, next time, we will be talking about moral reasoning. Uh, moral reasoning, um, the moral reasoning chapter will, uh, it's not, ne it's not nearly as long or dense as this one. Uh, it's quite a nice fun read actually compared to this one. And, um, my lecture on that chapter will probably come close to the typical length that my lectures have been so far. So, um, I hope you're all continuing to do well. I hope you're all busy writing that midterm. This way, once you've done that, you won't have a super long lecture to worry about, just a short one today. Uh, geez, I can't believe I've managed to ramble so much in such a short lecture. But in any case, next time we'll be getting back on track uh, with more reasoning, and that'll be nice and fun. So for now, I hope you're all continuing to do well and stay safe. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. I'd love to hear more from you about your thoughts today on this material in the comments section. And do let me know about those follow-up lectures. I still have the poll going. I'm still waiting for more responses. And I have some uh, forums on CU Learn now where you can post questions for week one and week two and week three. So questions about any of the two lectures in one, two, and three, you can leave on CU Learn. Please do that, and I will create follow-up lectures to address your questions. Okay? So, I'll see you all next time when we talk about moral reasoning. Take care, and bye for now.